Cable 7 and 103.7 WTIB present Talk of the Town with Henry Hinton. News, sports, and community information and everything that's going on around town. Now, with Talk of the Town, here's your host, Henry Hinton. (laughs) Back for hour two. I'm a little out of breath. Coach and Michael were screaming down the hall during the news break. 30 seconds! I couldn't find Stairway to Heaven, so I just want you to I was going to say, I almost had a (laughs) Stairway. I was almost in a situation where we had Stairway to Heaven playing on a talk station for the first time. (laughs) (laughs) That's a joke from yesterday. All right, welcome. Mexican last night, eh? (laughs) No. How are you, McGee? Nice to see you. I'm well. I'm well. Uh, Carly Swain is uh, doing news for us today, but she's out in the field. There was a shooting in Kinston last night, and she's out there uh, in the field today covering that. So we'll be talking to her by phone here in a couple minutes. Uh, the big news today is the weather. And um, this cold front that's moving across the uh, country right now from uh, west to east. Actually, it's coming down. Uh, our friend Robert Frederick from the National Weather Service was on last night. and he actually said it's moving down from the Great Lakes, didn't he? He did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. First Cleveland got LeBron James, and now this. Yeah. <laughs> Le- Le- LeBron James fever continues. The fever's everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. Everywhere. I mean, it's crazy. But the um, the cold front is going to bring, uh, you know, it's going to collide with all this warm air over here in the east today, and uh, it's going to create some... Uh, some stuff that may be a problem, so you need to be on the lookout for it. It's going to be um, going to be thunderstorms, high winds, potential hail. Although Robert said probably not much hail. And um, but the big the big concern is uh, high winds. He says you know that right now it doesn't look like a tornado kind of a thing, but you never know. That you possibility know. still exists, and so. Starting about 3 o'clock this afternoon, be on the lookout for uh, this uh, huge cold front. And you'll be able to see it coming on the radar if you go and watch it on the radar because it's coming, right? Oh, it, we'll know. It's definitely I mean, you know, It'll hit Raleigh first and then come down, down east, and uh, it'll get us eventually. Uh, speaking of LeBron James, the um, LeBron James fever continues. David Letterman last night. We got this turned up. Who's who's running audio? I can't see. Oh, good morning. All right, here we go. LeBron James going back to Cleveland, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. In return, Cleveland released five Taliban prisoners. <laughs> <laughs> LeBron James <laughs> left Miami, Florida to return to Cleveland, Ohio. The reason for that, of course, those mild Cleveland winters. (laughs) (laughs) And they're going to have it today. Thank you, Julia. People really haven't put that into perspective yet. He left Miami for Cleveland. When you you think about the two cities, you know? Yeah. Yikes. Exactly. Coach Carr, um, did you? Uh, Conan O'Brien was talking about uh, Baltimore Ravens. You know, you're such a big Ravens fan because you. I told him they're getting arrested left in and Baltimore. right. That's the fifth coach, Baltimore Raven, to get arrested this season. He played it down. Coach Carr played coach, it down. Any comment? No comment. <laughs> Conan O'Brien had a comment last night. This weekend, a Baltimore Ravens cornerback became the fifth Raven, fifth Raven to be arrested this off season. Yeah. Now, on the upside, the Baltimore State Prison is about to have one hell of a football team. <laughs> it's be a great football team. Uh, Seth Myers last night on LeBron James. The other big sports story, LeBron James announced this weekend he's going back to the Cleveland Cavaliers. Though there may be an awkward moment when he says, hey, what happened to that jersey I left here? <laughs> it caught on fire. <laughs> By accident? <laughs> On purpose. <laughs> this, does Seth Meyers sound like Barney Fife a little bit? A, a little bit, yeah. He does. Listen to the way he starts it. The other big sports story, LeBron James. The other big sports story, Andy. On fire. 
On purpose? Now, what you going to see here at the Mayberry Jail? Andy. Andy. Uh, Carmelo Anthony has decided to stay with the New York Knicks. All this NBA news is making me crazy. Making you crazy, huh? But he's staying. Carmelo's staying. LeBron's leaving. Uh, Seth Myers was talking about all that last night. An amazing weekend in sports. LeBron went back to being a Cavalier. Carmelo went back to being a Nick. And soccer went back to being a thing you drive your kids to. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> that's the best line of the night. That's funny. Oh, man, I love that. Uh, let's see. Uh, a couple of things here. There's a, um, there's a football story out this morning on NFL.com where this guy, Mike Huguenin, ranks, all, ranks the top ten college football programs with regard to how they stack up with their quarterbacks. And well, where do you think the Pirates of East K are the Pirates in the top ten? He ranks the top ten only. The top ten only. Um, you ready? Number ten is Arizona State. Okay. Number nine is the Naval Academy, which is really interesting that Navy would be in the top ten for quarterbacks because don't they still run that wishbone? Mm-hmm. That makes sense though, as the program but relates he, to the quarterback. Well, I, I guess so. That. You know, he says. Uh, Keenan Reynolds, who's the starting quarterback so in the Navy. So basically they're saying... He's, uh, he, he play, he's, he's not big, but he plays huge. This is how important per the quarterback perfect, is to the system. Perfect fit for Navy's triple option offense. Yeah, I guess so. Number eight, Rasheem Cato from Marshall. Hmm. Rakeem. What'd I say? Rasheem. That's his brother. You say Rasheem. I say Rakeem. That's all the same. You say potato. I say potato. Mm -hmm. Number seven, Utah State. Okay. Number six, UCLA. And number five, the Pirates of East Carolina University. Mm -hmm. See if I can name the top four. Here's what he says. And they list the starter and the backup, Shane Carden and Kurt Binkett. Binkert. It says Carden is heading into his third season as the starter. He's coming off a 4,139-yard, 33-touchdown season and has thrown for 7,255 yards and 56 TDs in his first two seasons as a starter. He had two 400-yard games and, 300 and seven 300-yard outings last season. He's also completed 70.5% of his passes last season, an impressive figure considering he put it up 549 times. He completed 61.1% of his passes as a first-time starter in 2012. So it's safe to say he understands ECU's version of Mike Leach's air raid offense. Binkert is a redshirt freshman. So they rank East Carolina number five in the nation in terms of uh, having the best quarterback situation. By the way, Baylor was four, Ohio State three, Oregon two, and Florida State with uh, uh, Jameis Winston was uh, number Those one. Those were all my guesses, by the way. Thanks. Well, I asked if I could guess. Are you just guess. trying you to just, sound knowledgeable? Well, no, you just, you just named them off. I was going to guess. Oh, you were going to guess them? But those are my guesses, so you, you got it. Good job. <laughs> but here's the thing. I mean, uh, you know, having seen East Carolina play against Marshall, you, if you're a Marshall fan, you could make an argument that that makes no sense. Because uh, Rakeem Cato, really, uh, in that game last year head-to-head, -head, had a much better game than Shane Carden did. No doubt. That. So it has a lot to do with what the defenses are giving you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, good to see ECU get that kind of, If you want to see that, it's on NFL.com. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Mike Huguenin ranking every FBS quarterback situation numbers 1 to 10. 46 days away. 46 days and counting. Yeah, I'm excited. It's coming. Um, we've been talking a lot here in Greenville about the, um, about the tax increase and uh, the subsequent conversations and letters to the editor and newspaper articles and internet articles on Greenville headlines, editorials, about whether or not this tax increase was necessary and whether or not the city was hiding money. Uh, in this morning's Greenville Reflector, the liberals are speaking up. All of Calvin Mercer's friends have stepped forward to uh, 
they're they're coming forward now. So this guy Hugh Cox, who's a huge liberal writer in the uh, Reflector, is saying that in our Greenville is is our Greenville City Council hoarding sixteen million dollars of free cash, as suggested by Terry Boardman. What Mr. Boardman misses is that the 2013 city financial sheet he cites contains many spending commitments tagged as reserved and restricted. For example, those exemplary patrons who gift who who gift funds to Shepherd Memorial Library are listed on the balance sheet, but those funds are not free cash as identified by Mr. Boardman. For years, Mr. Boardman complained that certain members of the council were inexperienced, wasteful, and incompetent, yet past city council officials before Mayor Alan Thomas were frugal and accumulated adequate money reserves. Any tax increase can be traced directly to Mayor Alan Thomas and his supporters on the last council. See, it's more of the... Uh, it's more of the Alan Thomas versus uh, Calvin Mercer thing, which is what uh, Calvin Mercer's uh, – that, that's always Calvin Mercer's uh, response and Calvin Mercer's supporters' response. Now, also in the, uh, in the local newspaper this morning, a letter to the editor from the city manager, Barbara Lipscomb, who was in here last week. Mm -hmm. And she says in a recent letter to the editor, a citizen made allegations that the city's either cooking the books – are moving money around to make things look financially worse than they really are. This citizen even goes on to claim that he found $16 million in free cash, which can be spent right away. The city finances are audited by independent auditing firms who understand the laws regarding government finances, and those audits are further reviewed by the Local Government Commission, Division of the State Treasurer's Office. For more than 25 years, the city has received what is now referred to as an unmodified opinion of the audited financial statement, meaning that uh, final, final information has been presented fairly and complies with all accounting standards. It's also the highest opinion a city can receive from an internal, uh, external auditor. Regarding the claim that the city has $16 million in free cash, what this citizen included is, what has this citizen included as free cash? Based upon separate correspondence he sent to the city, this includes money that is non-spendable as, as it is due to vendors' funds whose Uses are restricted by an outside entity, such as a bond proceeds, federal forfeiture funds, controlled substance funds, multiple capital gain funds, yada, yada, yada. He, she also mentions the Shepherd Memorial Library fund balance. Uh, she says, I would encourage anyone with questions about the city's finances to go to our website, greenvillenc.gov, and look at the annual budgets, comprehensive annual financial reports, and financial policies, and see for themselves that the city has been and will continue to be open and transparent in how dollars are being handled. Uh, Barbara Lipscomb, Greenville City Manager. Now, here's what I would say about all that. I see both sides of it. But here's the question. You know, when you say money is being um, identified, you know, like this, Just take, I'm just going to take the vehicle replacement fund as an example, that we now know there's seven point. Two million dollars in the vehicle replacement fund. So you could say, well, that money can't be touched because it's in the vehicle replacement fund, and that money's being set aside. But the question is, can it be touched? And I would say that the city council can do whatever they want to do with that money. Now, th there may be state laws that prohibit them from touching money that they get from drug forfeitures. I think that money has to be spent through in police actions and stuff like you know police equipment and that kind of stuff you know but the the question about this 7.2 million dollars sitting in a uh, in a fund to buy vehicles you know you ask yourself how many vehicles are we going to buy <laughs> you know now and i know that a fire truck can cost as much as a half million to uh, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars easily mm -hmm. Uh, you know, but seriously, uh, and, and I don't know the answer to this. I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying I see both sides of it. The question is, could there have been some of that money taken out of the vehicle replacement fund to bridge the gap to keep from having to make a tax increase? And could you have taken, is there enough in there that if you took half of it out, it would have made any difference? We might, you know, you might say, well, they still, the, 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 the budget still wouldn't be balanced. And then there's also the matter that no one seems to want to talk about was this this mystery money that was set aside for the town common, $150,000 set aside for the town common, and 100. I mean, you know, $150,000 is a lot of money, but in a budget the size of Greenville's budget, 
not really. But still, you know, how many other decisions are there like that we don't know about? It, you know, when you say there's $150,000 and the city manager was asked, uh, you know, well, what's that money for? Was, you know, the, you guys, the city council told me to set that money aside. For what? What? They don't know. They haven't made any decisions with it yet. So uh, what kind of budgeting is that? But again, it's only $150,000. So I don't, you know, but, but I, I, I'm telling you, I see both sides of this. And it goes back to my editorial on Greenville Headlines two weeks ago. At this point, after watching the way the taxes were increased with no citizen input, not being on the agenda, it is a matter of trust, and that's what you're seeing right now. You're seeing the citizens of Greenville saying, you know what? We, you haven't convinced us that you needed to take more money out of our pockets. You were not convinced. You know, you, you know, now they're trying to justify it, and they're trying to explain it when Terry Boardman and others have come forth with all these uh, with all these uh, charts and graphs saying here's you know here's here's where you could have gotten money you didn't have to raise the taxes and you also have the mayor of the city on record now saying that we didn't have to raise taxes so you know I'm I'm just saying it's a matter of trust and that's why there is such consternation in the community about these tax increases because there wasn't enough scrutiny given to it. And the way it went about, it was, you know, again, I, I think you have to distrust the way it was done because they show up at a meeting. One of the city council people is not there. It's not on the agenda. It wasn't discussed. The mayor even said, you know, he talked to city council people that day on the phone and asked them, you know, what do you, you know, what's coming up tonight? What do you want to talk about, et cetera? No one mentions tax increase. And all of a sudden, boom, a tax increase is not, that's not on the agenda is voted on and passed with no public input. And then they had, you know, I mean, and, but before anybody could even know what, now they're going to say, well, you know, we did what was legally necessary. We had a public hearing and all that. But all that was done was in a matter of weeks and nobody, I mean, it was like done bing, bang, boom. Nobody knew what was going on. If you had a public hearing on it again today, I think you'd see a council, you'd see a council chamber full of, of mad folks saying, you know, prove it. Prove to us you have to raise our taxes. And that's what's going on right here. And listen, I like Barbara Lipskin. I think Barbara's probably doing a great job. I don't. I don't. I'm not in a position to make that decision. And, um, but but I'm telling you, it's a matter of trust. It's a matter of it, the way they went about it. They've created a distrust that's going to linger for a long time. And you know, my guess is next year during the uh, campaign, this whole thing's going to come back up. You know, because these, these, again, what we all have to remember, it's our money and they work for us. So, you know, I understand the city manager trying to explain herself in the newspaper. And I think she's done a, a good job. And, you know, she, and I, I, do, I do not have any feelings that there was something nefarious done by the city manager or the city staff. I don't have that feeling. I just have a feeling that there wasn't enough scrutiny given, and the way that they went about doing the budget this year, you know, it was just, I, I seriously believe that it all came about because of the comments by the financial services director when the, when the legislature passed that, that uh, business uh, license, what do they call it, privilege license? Privilege. Cap when they cap the business, <laughs> you know, you you had the city's financial uh, services director in the newspaper saying, "Well, I tell you, this is a real problem for us. We we may have to raise taxes two cents." And I think that's about the extent of what the city council <laughs> heard. And they said, "Well, okay, we're going to raise city. We're going to raise uh, city council. We're going to raise city taxes two cents." Boom, just like that. No discussion about this vehicle replacement. No discussion about where can we get money. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, one philosophy versus another. You know, again, it's just like what happens in your household. When you have unexpected expenses come up, what do you do? You, you, have, to cut your, you have to cut your spending. And um, I don't remember any discussion about any of that. 
<laughs> None. It was just like one meeting. Oh, we got a problem? Let's raise taxes. Boom. So it's a philosophy. It's a different philosophy. And the attitude was, well, you know, we cut taxes a couple years ago. Well, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> By the way, um, we looked up, we were talking earlier about the, uh, about the book. Yes. I was right. The name of the book that was written about the, uh, about the Washington murders, the Von Stein murders, the book was called Bitter Blood. Isn't that what I said? Yeah. And then our caller says she thought it was Blood Games and, and that the movie was Bitter Blood. I think it was exactly the opposite of that. Jerry Bledsoe's book on the Washington murders was uh, written in 1988. It was Bitter Blood by Jerry Bledsoe, the famous writer out of Greensboro. It went to number one. By the way, thanks to Sharonda, who sent me uh, this on Facebook just now. It went to number one on the New York Times bestseller list. And then I think there was a movie made. Um, let's see. There was a movie. Yeah, there was a movie made. There was there were several things. In a 1994 television movie, this is from Wikipedia, based upon the novel, was produced and named... In the best of families, marriage, pride, and madness. Jeff Bleckner, who also directed Medium Hawthorne in Boston Legal, was the director for the film. In the best of families, has a runtime of 200 minutes, was originally released and played on CBS in a two-part series on January 16 and 18, 1994. It is being rerun on cable under the name Bitter Blood. The story was also adapted for an episode uh, on investigation discovery called Southern Fried Homicide. Southern Fried On investigation discovery. Do you watch investigation no, discovery? I, I don't. You know what I do? I don't. I've, I heard, like, I've heard of people that do when watch it. When there's nothing does. else on and I want to watch TV, I, yeah. I, it, there's always a good thing on. Uh, there's always something good on investigation discovery. That's I, a pretty I've, good I've channel. That's pretty good. Yeah. All right, uh, let's get a break in. We're coming back. More talk of the town here uh, for Tuesday morning. We're going to turn our attention to the legislature, and we talked earlier about whether we should have an 11% raise for school teachers, as the Senate wants, or a uh, 6%, as the uh, House and the governor want. Uh, Becky Gray from Carolina Journal and the John Locke Foundation coming up. We'll be right back. The big one is on at Greenville Toyota, and the deals are hot. hot, hot. Get big one deals on new Corollas from $139 a month, Camrys $159 a month, and these aren't leases, you own it. Or drive with no interest for up to six years with no payments until fall. And we want to finance your future, not your past. Our goal is 100% credit approval, and you'll get it all with a Greenville Toyota Advantage. The big one deals are hot, hot, hot at Greenville Toyota, where if you give us 15 minutes, we can lower your payment. When you're on the go, it's Trade Wilco. No matter where you go in Eastern Carolina, there's sure to be an attractive and always clean Trade Wilco Hess station nearby. For the absolute lowest prices on gas, groceries, and travel necessities, stop at any of the Trade Wilco Hess stations throughout Eastern Carolina. Keep your eyes on the road, but remember to look for the green and white Hess sign. The best part? No one supports the ECU Pirates more. So when you're on the go, it's Trade Wilco. Stallings Mobile and Mini Storage Company will deliver a storage unit to your home or business today. Stallings Storage is the only local company providing mobile storage units 8x15 or 8x10 delivered to your site. If you are remodeling your home or office or need to store merchandise and inventory at your business, you need to call Stallings Mobile and Mini Storage. We deliver, pick up, and store it for you. It's that easy and there's no need to send your business out of town when your mobile storage needs can be met right here with people you know. Stallings Mobile and Mini Storage is located in Pitt County on B. Stokes Road. It's a well-secured facility with a living manager. Fixed units range from 5 feet by 10 feet to 40 feet by 40 feet. We store boats, cars, anything you need. We are Pirate Supporting Pirates. Call Stallings Mobile and Mini Storage today at 321-2300. That's 321-2300. Where were you? It was about 4.30. I'd come home early for our anniversary. Then the call came. It was the doctor with my results. The last thing I remember is hearing those three words, you're cancer free. 
all across Eastern North Carolina, Vident Health Cancer Care Specialists and Navigators offer a team approach to detecting, treating, and beating the disease. Call Vident Health for Cancer Care. Unlock the best life has to offer for generations to come. Introducing the Legacy Membership exclusively at Ironwood Golf and Country Club. As a Legacy member, you'll not only enjoy all the benefits of an active, family-friendly lifestyle, your children and grandchildren will enjoy membership status as well. Belonging to Ironwood is remarkable. Sharing it with your entire family is even better. Become a Legacy member today, only at Ironwood Golf and Country Club. Golf at its finest, life at its fullest. That's what I'm talking about, a little Boston this morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good tune right there. All right, uh, it's 8.30. Let's go to the phones right now. Carly Swain is out in the field this morning for WITN, and she's been covering a shooting in Kinston. Our news update this hour brought to you by Cellular Warehouse. Stand by for that telephone number that I give uh, every couple of days to uh, get Toby Williams to come straight to you rather than you waiting in line at the cell phone store. Here is Carly Swain. Carly, you in Kenston still this morning? Back in Greenville this morning, Henry, the breaking news is out of Kenston this morning. Police are saying they're working to find out who fired a gun at a local home while people were actually still inside last night. Commander Russell of the Kenston Department of Public Safety said around 12.30 this morning they got a call of shots fired at 1503 Perry Park Drive. This address just across the street from Fairfield Park off West Vernon Avenue. And the Russell said there were people home at the time, but he could not specify how many or if any children were among those inside. Thankfully, no one was hurt, according to police, but no word yet on any arrests in that case. And Commander Russell also mentioned at 6.30 last night, police got several calls of shots fired on Morningside Drive, that location less than two miles away from Perry Park Drive. Russell added while they had calls for shots fired in the area, police arrived and found no one hurt, no shell casings left behind. Therefore, at this point, officers cannot confirm there was a shooting near Morningside Drive. We're following up with investigators today. Stay tuned to WITN. In other news this morning, a man who shot and killed a man nearly two years ago accused of opening fire in the same apartment complex where a fatal shooting happened. That man is 20-year-old Marvin Norris Jr. Havelock Police say that Norris fired a gun toward Building B of the Kelly Park Apartments on Shipman Road on Sunday at Havelock. One bullet made it inside, but no one was hurt. Police and Norris also shot out a car that was leaving the apartment complex. Back in November of 2012, Norris was cleared of a fatal shooting at the same apartment complex. The Craven County DA Scott Thomas says the Castle Doctrine protected Norris. He shot and killed a man named Dimitri Berry when he and another man, Marcus Nunez, broke into Norris's apartment. Police say that Berry and Nunez had a golf club and baseball bat and believed that Norris had broken into their home. Now police are looking for Norris in the recent shots fired case. And finally this morning, shockwaves still overwhelming a local community after deputies say that three children woke up this morning without their mother and their father behind bars. Their father is a Marine who deputies say shot and killed the mother of his three children in a violent rage. 32-year-old Sergeant Christopher Skaggs is being held at the Onslow County Jail after being arrested Sunday night after that shooting, which was at 945. The sheriff's office says that Skaggs went into a rage, got his handgun, and shot his 31-year-old wife, the mother of their children, Jordan Skaggs. The sheriff's office says she died with multiple gunshot wounds to the chest after that argument at their Cherry Blossom Lane home. The sheriff says their three children were across the street at their neighbor's house at the pool. Those neighbors say the kids are staying with them for now. That's a look at your WITN News update for this Tuesday morning. Time now is 8.32 and just a tick below 80 degrees outside in Greenville. Henry? All right. Thank you, Carly. Appreciate that. Carly Swain out and about covering the news this morning. Let's check some uh, weather now. And uh, this afternoon could get interesting. Here's McGee with our weather update. Yeah, thunderstorms, uh, some could be very strong this afternoon. Starting later this morning into the afternoon, again, some storms could be severe to wrench up. Potential heavy downpours, large hail, and damaging winds could uh, be a result of what you see today. Highs today, 88 degrees. Lows tonight, 71, with the rain chance and storm chance continuing into tonight. For your Wednesday, again, a 60% chance of rainfall and uh, severe thunderstorms with highs of only 84 degrees, though much cooler for your Wednesday. Cool lows for Wednesday night, lows around 66, and for Thursday, should clear out of here. Uh, those storms and uh, rain chance should clear out. Partly sunny sky skies for Thursday with a high of just 85 degrees and lows in the mid-60s. All right, our news and weather update of service this hour. Cellular Warehouse. This is the cell phone company that comes to you folks. Toby Williams, my friend, 
who just uh, came by last week while I was on the air here and uh, hooked me up with a brand new Note 3. This is the coolest phone ever. It's a nice phone. It is, fa it is lightning fast, by the way. Uh, Toby, Carla Sutherland, and uh, Candy Kent, uh, they travel the roads of eastern North Carolina from Elizabeth City all the way down to Wilmington. They'll come to you to take care of all your cell phone needs and your cellular needs. And uh, I'm telling you, they do a terrific job. Last week was a perfect example when Toby came by here. I uh, had cracked the screen on my phone. He came by here, and by the time I got off the air, I had a brand new Note 3 with a OtterBox on. I actually had to drop the OtterBox off later, and I've already dropped it once. And I didn't break it. Got to be time. careful. Yeah, exactly. So here's the number to call uh, for the guys that will save you money, but really save you a lot of time, so you're not standing in line in those uh, wireless uh, offices waiting for your number and having some pimply faced kid say, "33, you're next." <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. We don't have that phone. No, I'm sorry. No, no. No, you're going to have to pay four hundred dollars for that. <laughs> here's the uh, here's the telephone number to deal with. Uh, some folks who know what they're doing and will come to you. Toby Williams and Cellular Warehouse, 252-799-7051. Write it down, 252-799-7051. It's Cellular Warehouse. All right, we're going to break. Coming back, Becky Gray from Carolina Journal up next to tell us what in the world is going on in Raleigh with the legislature and when are they going to get out of there? We'll be right back with Becky. East Carolina Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram has your new truck this summer. Save up to $10,000 on a new Ram 1500 or lease it for only $139 a month. East Carolina Chrysler Dodge Jeep across from the Cracker Barrel in Greenville. Cherry. Explosively Cherry. Top Dog Academy is Eastern North Carolina's complete dog training facility. Top Dog provides an excellent environment for dogs of all ages with training services and work week daycare. Top Dog is located on Highway 43 South, just four miles from Bells Fork, and features a comfortable, healthy environment and a spacious facility for daycare and a brand new, beautiful facility for training. Call 752 8215 or visit topdogonline.com. Come on out Highway 43 South to Top Dog Academy, where we know dogs. At the law firm of Hardy & Hardy, we don't simply take cases. We take your case personally. I've been in several car accidents, and each time I've turned to Hardy & Hardy for help. They are honest, hardworking, and dependable. I've been satisfied with the conclusion of each case, and I would recommend Wayne and Charles Hardy to my family and friends. You matter to us. Protecting the rights of the seriously injured. Stallings Mobile and Mini Storage Company will deliver a storage unit to your home or business today. Stallings Storage is the only local company providing mobile storage units 8x15 or 8x10 delivered to your site. If you are remodeling your home or office or need to store merchandise and inventory at your business, you need to call Stallings Mobile and Mini Storage. We deliver, pick up, and store it for you. It's that easy and there's no need to send your business out of town when your mobile storage needs can be met right here with people you know. Stallings Mobile and Mini Storage is located in Pitt County on Beast Oaks Road. It's a well-secured facility with a living manager. Fixed units range from 5 feet by 10 feet to 40 feet by 40 feet. We store boats, cars, anything you need. We are Pirate Supporting Pirates. Call Stallings Mobile and Mini Storage today at 321-2300. That's 321-2300. Summer savings have arrived at East Carolina Chrysler Dodge Jeep. Save up to $4,000 on a new Dodge Journey or lease the all new Jeep Cherokee for just $199 a month. East Carolina Chrysler Dodge Jeep across from the Cracker Barrel in Greenville.
Becky Gray is on the telephone. Becky is with the Carolina Journal and uh, the John Locke Foundation, a frequent contributor to uh, NC Spin and a good friend and uh, I think probably one of the most knowledgeable people about what's going on at the legislature. Good morning, Becky. How are you? Good morning. Doing great. Hey, you are. Thanks for ha- thanks for having me on here. Yeah, great, abs- to, great to be with you. Yeah, it's always great to have you on. We get the straight poop because you're over there every day and you know what's going on. <laughs> hey, the governor was down here last night. He was in Moorhead City, and uh, he's still he's still saying I'll veto the budget if the Senate doesn't back down. And then yesterday he was uh, he interviewed with Mike Collins in a radio interview over in Charlotte, and he uh, likened what was happening with Phil Berger and Tom Apodaca and Harry Brown to uh, to the Bass Night Rand days. The uh, the Senate president didn't take too lightly to that and said, it, you know, name calling was he put out a statement. Phil Berger did last night saying, you know, we don't have to do name calling. But look, there's let's be honest about it. There, there's some really hard feelings behind the scenes that no one in the Republican Party can kind of understand why the Senate uh, uh, digs in on some of these things. What What's the latest on this? I mean, does anybody really believe that? throwing all the teachers' assistants out and, and taking people off Medicaid so we can give school teachers an 11% raise is really a good idea? Well, you, you, you threw a lot of stuff at me. Let me kind of, you know, how, how long have we got here? <laughs> About 15 minutes. Go. Um, right. Okay. Um, you know, one of the first things is this, this controversy between the House, and there's really three players in this, the, the House, the Senate, and the governor's office. Um, and we see a lot of push and pull, and, and these are opinionated people. I think that, that all three of these entities, if you will, are very committed to conservative policies and moving the state forward in a conservative way that they were all elected to do. Um, this bickering and the going back and forth is really nothing new. We saw this under Democrat administrations. We saw it when Democrats were in control of the governor's office in both bodies of the General Assembly. Kind of the difference is, first of all, this is new. These are new personalities, and so there's you know sort of this fascination with all of this. The liberal media, in many cases, feed that. Of, you know, yep. they're not getting along, they're not getting along, they're not getting along. I agree. Another big difference is with Republicans and, and all of these people that, that we're talking about today, one of the things that they committed to also was open government and open meetings and not doing things behind closed doors. Mm-hmm. People who have been around for a long time, people who have sat in these budget negotiations and other negotiations about very important issues that have faced North Carolina, have said this same kind of squabbling and fighting took place but it was all done behind closed doors. So yeah. we didn't have, you know, the, the tweets being updated and the blogs being done and the news reports every day because <laughs> it was all done behind closed doors. And, and, let, me, and let, me say, let me say this. I, I witnessed some of that. If, if For people who think it's only the Republican, I witnessed some of that. You know, we, we heard so much about Mark Bass Night during the days that the Democrats ran the state. But I'll tell you, I, I, I have, I, you know, when Jim Black was the Speaker of the House, of course, you know, Jim Black ended up in some trouble. But, you know, he was very powerful at one time as well. And I know that Jim Black and Mark Bass Knight often disagreed and banged heads as well. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, none of this is the, the good news is that the Republicans have really moved forward with transparency in the process. The bad news is now we have to watch it. You know? when, yeah. When they were doing it behind closed doors, it was ugly, but we didn't have to watch it. Now we do. So, you know, there's that. <laughs> none, none of this is new. As far as the different positions on this, we have been involved. We at, at the Lot Foundation and Carolina Journal have been involved with these budget negotiations since the very beginning, going back to February and March. And, um, you know, the, the positions that the Senate has taken, the positions that the House has taken, and the positions that the governor has taken go back, and they are all really founded in really strong beliefs on this is what we need to do to move North Carolina forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, the House, and, and where we are right now today is the budget negotiators have settled everything except education and health and human services. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, so that's about, we're about 25% there. Um, education and health and human services are the biggest part of our budget, and this is where the real controversy lies. And where we are with this is, as you mentioned, the Senate is at an 11% average pay increase for the teachers. They are, the, the one thing, I, I'm not sure how all this is going to shake out, but the one thing that I can guarantee is that teachers are going to get a pay increase yeah, coming out of this. Exactly. Everybody is committed to that. The question is, how much and how do you pay for it? 
Now, the House has come out with it with a conservative and more cautious approach at 5%, although yesterday in some negotiations, it looks like with the revenue, the current revenue that we have, they may be able to go up to 6%. The Senate has said we want an 11% pay increase. That would constitute the largest pay increase for teachers in North Carolina's history. Um, they are committed to that. Now, again, how do you pay for it? Well, the existing revenue, we can do about a 5 6% pay increase. If you go up to 11 you're going to have to take money from someplace else in order to pay for that. And the way that the Senate does that, as you mentioned, they eliminate teacher assistants, not all teacher assistants, but teacher assistants at the second and third grade level. Now, Henry, I know this sounds counterintuitive, but what empirical research, what empirical studies tell us is that teacher assistants do make a difference in the lower grades. But in second and third grades, there is not a correlation between having a teacher assistant in the classroom and student performance. So that's where the Senate has based their mm-hmm. their proposal on those things. Right. Um, the Senate, the House disagrees with that. Now, one way that, and we have worked up a a four part compromise proposal at the Lott Foundation. Um, it was in. It was on Carolina Journal Online yesterday, and I'm telling you, you know, it is the best summary of where we are, how we got there, and how we might be able to break this impasse. So what's the solution? Okay, on the teacher pay, pay thing, the thing that we are proposing is that we give teachers a 6% pay increase, as the House has proposed, but then we allow local governments the local education districts, the school districts, to spend the teacher assistant money as they want to. Hmm. And if a local government wants to use their te- their teacher assistant money to pay teachers up to an 11% pay increase, they can do that. Wow, if what a great don't, idea. Yeah. Then teachers, you know, so what you've kind of got is you've got the house plan. But you're going to put, but then, but then you're going to put that debate about whether we should eliminate teaching assistants or not on the local county boards of education. And it's going to be very controversial at that level, too, isn't it? It it may very well be. Now, what we have heard in the House last week, you know, you may have heard about the meeting where the senators got up and left the meeting. Oh, yeah, last Friday, yeah, on Thursday. Yeah, yeah. and what that was all about was the House had brought in a group of superintendents from across the state and some teachers Mm -hmm. to speak to the group and talk about how important teachers' assistants were to the education in their particular areas. So what that would do is, again, if those superintendents who came and spoke at the meeting and if they're superintendents and and leaders of the local school districts who really do believe that that the money is better spent on teacher assistants, they get to do that. Mm -hmm. If there are districts where they feel like the money is better spent to increase that teacher pay, up to what the Senate has proposed of 11%, then they can do that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah, it does take that debate back to the local level, yeah. but many of us, myself included, believe that a lot of those education decisions are better made closer to home. You know, I, so you, the thing, and I don't, I don't want to get too much into personalities, uh, and, and i got a couple of things I want to cover with you in a short period of time here. But the thing I don't understand is, you know, the 11% idea, why the Senate leadership is dug in so deeply on that, no one seems to think it's a good idea other than them. I mean, I've, I, you know, we've been taking phone calls. We've had school teachers calling in here. No one, including school teachers, thinks it's a good idea to, uh, to go to 11% at the expense of other things that, that people think – and I'm talking about people at ground zero, people inside the school systems think are important to the education process. Why is the Senate pushing this so hard, Becky? Henry, I can't, you know, I can't answer that. Um, I know when they came out with this, it was important to them to, to make a big splash, to make a, mm-hmm. you know, if we're going to do pe- teacher pay increases, if we're going to do really catapult North Carolina. But isn't it backfiring at this point? Level. I mean, the, the big splash is, is that they look like they're becoming unreasonable. Well, um, you know, that, that's what happens any time you have, you, you have disagreements and differences of opinion and right. that kind of thing. What I suspect we will do is, I, I spoke to, to 
several House members, several Senate leaders yesterday about the proposal that we had put out, the one that I just described to you, and most people were shaking their head, yes, that might be able to work. What we may see is a compromise somewhere maybe above the 6% raise, mm-hmm. but lower than the 11% raise. Yeah. And, you know, what, what kind of what we have to, here, too, is I think in order to try to answer your question, Henry, I really don't know, this is speculation on my part, but that the Senate wants to kind of do this all at once. The House is much more cautious in thinking that perhaps we could do a 5 or 6% raise this year, see how our revenue begins to turn around as the economy turns around in North Carolina due to some of the other decisions that they've made, and see where we are in a year year or two years, and if we can, then go back and bump it up again, gotcha. so that maybe over the course of several years, you would end up at perhaps an 11% mm-hmm. pay increase, mm-hmm. but not doing it all at once. Gotcha. But I suspect in the next couple of days that we're going to see some movement on there. We, we have yeah. to. I mean, you know, both... I, both I heard, I heard last been. night, kind of behind the scenes, that there may be some, uh, finally, some negotiating going on you know i didn't think they'd ever get together on the medicaid thing but and you know all of a sudden boom they you know they had that open meeting and proposals out in the public and they you know in a couple of hours they had a deal so right. you yeah, know back off. the mm-hmm. pot the posturing you know it'll end when the posturing begins to hurt one of the other sides and, right. and it's just this is just my opinion i i sense now that the posturing is hurting the senate and and mccrory has been out there yelling a veto and even though, uh, you know, they overrode his vetoes last year, I don't think they'd be able to override this one because the House is going to stand by the governor. So the Senate, well, the Senate knows that, and it seems to me that at some point when one, when, one, when one side begins to have more liability than the other, that's when you start to see somebody crack. <laughs> right. And, you know, there are some things, too, in there and other pieces of the budget because there are still some, some Medicaid questions. There's still $135 million mm-hmm. apart on some of the Medicaid and the Medicaid eligibility rules is, you know, really what we're talking about. Well, look, we only got so, like three minutes left, so I, I, and I, I want to ask you this because since you've talk, started talking about Medicaid, Health and Human Services is, uh, you know, when they, get to the, when they get to negotiating that, the big issue here in Greenville in eastern North Carolina is the issue of uh, the uh, UPL and SADCA. And uh, those are big funding mechanisms for the uh, Brody School of Medicine at East Carolina University. There's been some disagreement about that. Uh, Senator Bob Rucho uh, has been very hardcore against allowing the uh, Setoff Act to allow um, uh, the, the med school to use that, which we are told could cost the Brody School up to $6 million. The uh, upper payment limit Medicaid issue is going to be up to $15 million. So we're talking about $20 million plus in jeopardy. For the Brody School of Medicine, what do you know about that, and has Health and Human Services begun to talk about those issues yet? Here's what I think, and and you know what you're talking about too is is just at the Brody School of Medicine. We have other institutions around the state that would be impacted as well. Well, so well, we and you, you and you and see you and see hospitals as well because the right because because yeah. the UPL thing. And Sodka up till now has just been uh, uh, available to state state hospitals, right? Uh, or or so, medical schools, as in the case of Brody here. Mm-hmm. And what what I'm seeing on the Medicaid issue, really, and and this goes to exactly what you have just described. This is complicated. There are a lot. So much of this money and this funding is tied to federal money, that when you take away the state money, when you make a cut at the state level, it eliminates federal funding and matching funds and those kinds of things. And so it's very complicated. It's cobbled together with federal funding and federal programs and those kinds of things. Where we are, and particularly in this short session, I think that we are way beyond the point that we can really look at comprehensive Medicaid reform in this budget. I think what we need to get to is to make sure that there is enough money to pay for anticipated Medicaid expenses for the next fiscal year. And then I think what we need to do here in North Carolina, I think this discussion, this budget discussion, has raised some very important questions, some things that you've mentioned today and and a whole lot of other things, where really the prudent way to do this is to really look at this, put this into a study with the goal that we are we are going to do something about tightening Medicaid 
um, standards, el- the eligibility standards, and we're going to be able to get some budget mm-hmm. predictability with this. Cut made at Medicaid costs, but it has to be done right. Yeah. And to put this into a study and take a really hard look at it and look at all the moving parts and all the unintended consequences that may occur with any move within Medicaid. I hope, I hope, they, I hope they do that. I hope that does not slow down any funding for the med schools because uh, East Carolina, I think, is at about DEFCOM 2 with funding here. Yeah, and, so. and at this point, too, again, at this point in the short session, I think the prudent thing to do is make sure the money's there to get through the next fiscal year, yeah. and then let's really take a look at this. And, and we may see some real changes in the next right. couple of years, but it has to be done right. Becky, we got to go. Thank you, dear, for being on with us. You're always great, and uh, I love I love your work on NC Spin, and we read your column on the Carolina Journal, and uh, we appreciate all that you do for the citizens of North Carolina, and, and love having you on the show. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I love being on here, too. Thanks talk to you. Talk to you soon. Becky Gray from Great. Carolina Journal and uh, the John Locke Foundation. Talk of the Town here at 854, brought to you in part this morning by PACR Recycling and Trash. PACR Disposal and Recycling. Want you to throw away your trash, not your cash? PACR, the premier local trash and recycling company offering residential commercial services in eastern North Carolina. PACR provides residential customers with a 96-gallon trash cart, clean trucks, and experienced drivers. If you need service at your small business, you get to choose from four different size containers for all your trash and recycling. PACAR also offers a wide variety of roll-off open-top containers and compaction equipment for construction sites. Uh, these are the guys that uh, all the reputable businesses in town use for the most part. Uh, people like uh, Brown and & Wood and Greenville TV and & Appliance and A.R. Chesson and Custom Building. Thousands of residential customers. They use PACAR for trash pickup. And uh, I want you to call this number to uh, set this up at your place, your business or your home. Call my friend Bob over at Pack R. It's 252-974-1225. That's 974-1225 or visit visit PackRDisposal.com. That's P-A-K-R Disposal.com. All right, this break and then McGee's got sports. Be right back. At the law firm of Hardy and Hardy, we don't simply take cases. We take your case personally. I've been in several car accidents, and each time I've turned to Hardy and Hardy for help. They are honest, hardworking, and dependable. I've been satisfied with the conclusion of each case, and I would recommend Wayne and Charles Hardy to my family and friends. You matter to us. Protecting the rights of the seriously injured. East Carolina Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram has your new truck this summer. Save up to $10,000 on a new Ram 1500 or lease it for only $139 a month. East Carolina Chrysler Dodge Jeep across from the Cracker Barrel in Greenville. When you're on the go, it's Trade Wilco. No matter where you go in Eastern Carolina, there's sure to be an attractive and always clean Trade Wilco Hess station nearby. For the absolute lowest prices on gas, groceries, and travel necessities, stop at any of the Trade Wilco Hess stations throughout Eastern Carolina. Keep your eyes on the road, but remember to look for the green and white Hess sign. The best part? No one supports the ECU Pirates more. So when you're on the go, it's Trade Wilco. Stallings Mobile and Mini Storage Company will deliver a storage unit to your home or business today. Stallings Storage is the only local company providing mobile storage units 8x15 or 8x10 delivered to your site. If you are remodeling your home or office or need to store merchandise and inventory at your business, you need to call Stallings Mobile and Mini Storage. We deliver, pick up, and store it for you. It's that easy and there's no need to send your business out of town when your mobile storage needs can be met right here with people you know. Stallings Mobile and Mini Storage is located in Pitt County on Beast Oaks Road. It's a well-secured facility with a living manager. Fixed units range from 5 feet by 10 feet to 40 feet by 40 feet. We store boats, cars, anything you need. We are Pirate Supporting Pirates. 
Call Stallings Mobile and Mini Storage today at 321-2300. That's 321-2300. Summer savings have arrived at East Carolina Chrysler Dodge Jeep. Save up to $4,000 on a new Dodge Journey or at least the all new Jeep Cherokee for just $1.99 a month. East Carolina Chrysler Dodge Jeep across from the Cracker Barrel in Greenville. All right, let's check some sports now. Talk of the town sports. Here's Trent McGee. Major League Baseball All-Star Game tonight, 8 o'clock start for Minneapolis with the winner claiming home field advantage in the World Series. Final All-Star Game for longtime Yankee Derek Jeter. And we'll keep a close eye on Carolina Panthers defensive end Greg Hardy, whose trial starts today, Hen, as he's in court to face mm. charges that he beat up his ex-girlfriend during cracking. an altercation at uh, as his residence in May. Yeah, cracking. Cracking, cracking on trial. Cracking. Did he stay, he stay with the Panthers, didn't he? He did. Yeah. All right, very. Did you watch the uh, the home run derby last night? I did. Yeah, you did. Uh, Ioannis Cepetis. Who? Ioannis Cepetis. Ioannis. 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 I know. Your mama. No, no. Oh, not, I thought you meant Ioannis. No, was, not Ioannis. Your Ioannis. Not, not, not my Ioannis. Right, not Ioannis. <laughs> Ioannis Nevada. First repeat winners in fifteen years. Yeah. Did the Durham Bulls guy win the uh, International League? I saw that on the news last night. The Durham Bulls guy was competing. Dykstra. Alan Dykstra won it. Yeah. Yeah, he played at Wake Forest. Oh, no kidding? Yep. Good for him. All right, everybody have a great Tuesday. Watch out for that storm this afternoon. See you tomorrow.